Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Saya no Utao, or Song of Saya. Um, I played it before, uh, twice actually, more or less. Once I uh, played through and got most of the endings, or all the endings actually, I'm not sure. There's three endings uh, total for this game. It's rather short. It's uh, two to ten hours long. Um, yeah, I've already played through it once, and I did so because I really wanted to uh, enjoy it at my own pace, by myself, without having to worry about recording it and whatnot. And that was like right when it first came out as uh, English, and I uh, actually bought the DVD, not the DVD, the uh, game case and whatnot for it and whatnot. And then um, I decided to do another playthrough of it, or another like recording of it, not a necessary playthrough. And that one was just like uh, the first 20 minutes of the game to like, you know, get it out there because I enjoyed it and I thought, you know, hey, you guys should check this out if you like it, you know, support the developers and all that good stuff. But after playing, you know, Cartagra and um, all that good stuff, I decided that, hey, let's keep this visual novel train rolling. And I thought, what better to do than come back and revisit Song of Saya. So, that's what we're doing. Now, I did mention that I had a previous video of Song of Saya uploaded. It was only 20 minutes long. That one is now non-existent. I've set it to private, so it doesn't get confused with the current playthrough and whatnot. And so people can focus their attention to this one instead of the old one that is different. And this one um, now has voices of other the uh, other characters that aren't the main character and whatnot. And I'll just be doing voices of the main characters since, yeah, people tend to like that more, I believe. So um, I'll go ahead and do that. So let's get started. Stories work of fiction, the medical procedures and conditions described here in our imaginary and do not reflect actual science. Give that to my kids. Not real. The wriggling mash of flesh burbles. Three such creatures sit around the table in front of them, slurping filthy sludge from their cups as they trade wines, growls, and the sounds I cannot describe. <laughs> By listening carefully, I'm able to grasp the gist of their conversation and respond when it's required of me. And this is necessary to avoid uh, rousing their suspicion. However these creatures may look, they are my friends, apparently. I wish that I could still deny it, but I gave up on that a long time ago. Night after night, I went to sleep praying for an end to this night only to wake each morning to the same twisted hellscape as the day before. I know now that I have to blend in, that I have to act like one of them. Such has my life these past three months, and so it will remain until the day I die. <laughs> Judging by its tone, this one must be Koji, and the one next to him, squealing more than the others, is probably Omi, which means that the one next to me is Yo, though I can no longer see any trace of her once attractive features. I try best to ignore the rotten stench of excrement that ex issues from her quivering flesh. <laughs> Before you guys get the wrong impression, this is not all the entire thing is. Like, it's not just all this weird, like, jumbled garbage stuff. This is just, like, we're going into his mind, like, at the moment. And 
normal speak happens way more often than this stuff, just so you guys know. Hang in there. Everything has changed. Or almost everything. By some cruel ship of fate, my relationship to the world alone remains the same. As if an insane architect took the blueprints of my life and rebuilt it out of blood and gore. These monsters and I were part of the same college club. We studied together. Ate together. We even went skiing together every winter break. Now these are the painful memories of days that will never return. If only no one recognized me, I might have been able to disconnect myself from the world. It would have been comforting in comparison to believe that I had been attacked by aliens or that I had stumbled through a gateway to hell. But no, this is beyond a doubt the city where I was born and raised. The society that I was part of for 20 years, save that I and I alone can no longer see it that way. The world as I know it is gone. I have no place to call home. Anyway, I can tell that whatever they're talking about is of no importance to me. I decide to keep quiet while pretending to listen. But just then... One of the flesh beasts says as it swirls with bloodshot eyes towards me. About... what? I tried desperately to suppress my loathing and behave normally. My hoarse voice ruined the attempt. A slimy hole near the top of the creature arrives, nauseating, as it vomits some semblance of words. That must be Koji's face, or what I would have seen as such three months ago. Unable to stomach the sight of it, I avert my eyes and give a neutral answer. I don't know. Not really. These were my closest companions. One of them had even wished to be more. How many nights have I spent crying in loneliness, lamenting the friends who no longer exist? In three months, my tears ran dry. And now there's only loathing left in me. Surrounded by hideous creatures that I can only assume are Koji, Omi, and Yo. I spend each day trying to act as if I always have. If I fail at this, I'll surely be sent back to the hospital. Only this time, I'll be locked away forever. No matter what, I won't let that happen. I'm not sure. I'll ask the doctor in my checkup. That's it. I can't look at them, or bear their screeching any longer. I jump to my feet, desperate to escape. A spray of stingy slime from the cilia of its voice box flies at me. I try to cover myself, but too late to keep the slime from splattering across my face like the yolk of a rotten egg. I'm about to lose it. I want to grab a chair, a desk, anything within reach and use it to smash the life out of this creature, ending it all. I barely suppress the impulse. I mustn't let on that something is wrong. However, they look at me. This is their world. I'm the outsider here. Like I said, today's my checkup. I've gotta go. Struggling to put on a smile, I reach into my wallet. Pull out the first bill I find and put it under the table without even looking at it. I don't care about the change. I just need to get out of here. Now. Later. I mutter hastily and flee the cafeteria. I'm not crazy. Nee, nee. Kondo no ski da kedasa. 
今年はどっかスケートも遊べるところにしないあ、スクーバー、よ、ラウンズのスクジェッション。スケートわざわざスキー場にまで行ってスケート<笑>勘弁してやってくれよ、つくば。こいつ今、そっちにはまってんだ。Tono Koji supports Omi with a laugh. Her impromptu suggestions are nothing new, and it's Koji's role as her boyfriend to provide backup. So, let me provide some context here. This is what was actually happening in the real world, not in the、um, world that the main character is inside of. So, when all of the jumbled up language was happening, this is what they were actually saying. They're a good match for each other, Yo thinks. Sometimes it makes her jealous. Nancy, oh, me, Tessa. Conomai, Conotosini, not the Hajimita skater at Tanda. Nani, yo, skate to Stakoto Nakatanoma, so none of Shigi? Hatachini, not the Hatstai Kentenoa, Kyobi, so so in Ingeraikana? Kodomono Koroa, Nantonaku Koakatanoyo, Anoktu, Nandaka Hamono Mitai de Sa. Demo. いきなりやって滑れたのオウミちゃんすごくない要領はスキーとそう変わるもんじゃないからな重心を前に出して靴の前のヘリでコントロールする感覚とかコージにそう言われたもんだからさ騙されたと思ってやってみたわけよそう。So was a date Yo feels a stab of envy コージ and Omi enjoy their time together As normal lovers do. And that's certainly not something that should arouse jealousy. It's just that her luck in love has been bad. <laughs> Yo keeps her voice upbeat, trying to cover up her internal conflict. She knows that it's wrong to envy her friends. She too would be spending time with the man she admires, not for the terrible tragedy that befell him. His is true misfortune. Her bad luck doesn't even begin to compare. That's why, right? Next time, I'll go to the ski trip. 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 But, I'm going to go to the ski trip. I'm going to go to the ski trip. I'm going to go to the ski trip. わざわざスキー場に行ってまでやるだから屋内じゃなくてさ、屋外スケート、凍った湖とかで滑れるところ。そんな都合のいいとこあるかななんだかすっごく混んでそう。While speaking, Yo sneaks a sideways glance at the young man sitting next to her. All the conversation has involved only three people so far. There are, in fact, two couples at the cafeteria table. Yo's boyfriend, though there's still some doubt over whether he can be called that, is beside her, as silent as expressionless as a statue. Nah, Fuminori. Omae wa doumo. Perhaps Koji sensed Yo's pain, in his usual quiet and considerate way. About what? The cause of Yo's distress. Sakisaka Fuminori responds to、uh, Koji's sudden query with a vague, mumbled question of his own. Yeah, Dakara, sir. Kotoshi no Fuyo no ski dio. Omaimo Ikuyona. Koji speaks gingerly, as though probing a tumor. A few months ago, he would not have hesitated to rebuke Fu,、uh, Fuminori for his attitude. Their acquaintance. Had forged a strong and honest friendship. But now. I don't know. Fuminori responds bluntly, his downcast eyes and sullen demeanor making clear that he has no desire to break his silence. Not really. Even Koji, Fuminori's best friend, can't communicate with him as before. What hope does Yo have of breaking through his shell? The scars left by the events of that late summer day are still deep all these months later. Each one of the four bears them, not only Fuminori. Nah, Betsuni Undo Surunoga Kizuni Sawarutoka, so you wake them on Indaro. 
I'm not sure. I'll ask the doctor in my checkup. As though the answer drained the last of his patience, Fuminori bolts out of his chair. Oi, Fuminori! Even Koji can't keep his voice from rising as he tries to stop Fuminori from leaping. Fuminori reacts swiftly, throwing his hand over his face as though to shield himself from something terrifying. Maybe some spit flew out inadvertently from Koji's mouth. But that sort of thing happens during everyday conversation. Fuminori's reaction is beyond the pale. Like I said, Fuminori snaps, making no attempt to relieve the discomfort of his friends. Today's my checkup. I have to go. Even as he tosses money on the table to pay for his coffee, he acts like he's touching something filthy. Later. Fuminori stalks out of the cafeteria, almost as if he's running away. Cloaked in heavy silence, the remaining three lower their gaze to the table, where the abandoned 10,000 yen bill sways forlornly, Fuminori's coffee untouched. <laughs> Omi says with a sigh, but Koji shakes his head reproachfully. もう少し時間が必要なんだと思う。だってもう3ヶ月よ。何なのよあれ。付き合ってるこっちが変になりそうよ。俺だってわからない。わかるはずもないと思う。お前だって想像つくか。あんなひどい形で家族全員を奪われ
pure rejection. Realizing that she cannot interview him like this, Ryoko sighs and sets her charge aside. Treatment of a subdural hematoma through the use of micro machines, a procedure available in Japan exclusively here at the T University Medical Center, it had been the only way to save Sakisaka from Minori from a cerebral contusion that would have been fatal. Of course, Saki Sakafuminori's lips twist into what might be a bitter or mocking smile. But it is gone before Ryoko can discern its meaning. Putsu, Hence these weekly checkups. If only he would take them a little more seriously. How was last week's MRI? Saki Saka asks abruptly, as if to catch Ryoko off guard. MRI. Magnetic resonance imaging. is a way for doctors to examine the brain in detail without opening the patient's skull. Surprised by Saki Saka's uncommon technical knowledge, Ryoko recalls his profile. So, the kind of anomaly you're worried about should show up in the MRI, right? Do you find anything? Yeah. There was nothing. Not even the slightest hint of abnormal, abnormal activity. For a procedure with such a low rate of success, the results have been nothing short of miraculous. However, something still bothers Ryoko. She can't shake the feeling that he's hiding something beneath his guarded exterior. Some terrible weight on his soul, perhaps? But if it's an inorganic problem, then there's nothing she can do as long as he refuses to explain it. I'm fine, Doctor. I've lived on my own for three months without any problems. What could go wrong now? Hey, Sakisaka -san. I suppose you're right. I do want to trust you, Doctor. Can I come to you with anything? Ryoko answers, smiling to cover up her irritation. Sakisaka asks exactly the same question during last week's visit. Well then, let's pick up where we left off. Have you learned anything about Dr. Ogai? Unable to answer, Ryoko hardens the mask of her smile. As before, the patient is inquiring about someone whom he has no business knowing. You just told me to trust you, and now you're keeping secrets? Ryoko is used to patients treating her with hostility. After all, some degree of paranormal... Paranoia is natural when dealing with someone who holds your life in her hands. And Saki Saka, however, shouldn't see the short-sighted impatience that other patients exhibit. And his demeanor is perfectly calm, almost like a detective questioning a suspect. Do you know why he left? Yes, Ryoko answers smoothly, her earlier hesitation gone, having decided at the outset to lie. She has no trouble doing so with a straight face. Did you know that the doctor has gone missing? Ryoko realized that her answer may have seemed a bit too quick. She should have acted more surprised. I've recently become close with a relative of his. And it was she who asked me to find him. A relative? Ryoko considers with a frown. Oh? Who told you that? Ryoko replies, remembering that she just claimed to have had no contact with the man. I see. So 
But the doctor was famous enough for nurses to gossip about it. But no one knows why he left the university. <laughs> Ryoko falls silent, knowing that this isn't a topic she can brush away with a smile. Sakisaka seems to have finally grasped her mood. However, as his strangely stiff tone softens a little. Doctor, I absolutely must find Dr. Ogai. There's a girl who's lost without him. Can't you help me? Although she makes it sound like the most obvious thing in the world, the suggestion is actually a risky gamble. If Ogai and Mashi... One sec. Masahiko... Here we go. Masahiko's disappearance becomes a police matter, then the university will be investigated. Everyone who was involved in the incident will be at risk of exposure. And of course, that includes Ryoko herself. She knows, however, that Sakisaka, Sakisaka is unlikely to go to the police. First of all, his excuse is obviously a lie. They already made sure that Ogai had no relatives who might come looking for him, which is why they could bear the truth about what happened. But then how does Sakisaka, a mere patient, learn about Ogai? Sakisaka-san, I see. Expecting resistance, Ryoko is surprised when Sakisaka backs down. She's still worried about his condition, and the mysterious link between him and Ogai and Ashihiko is only making her more uneasy. But as long as he doesn't open up to her, there's nothing she can do. After a brief pause, Ryoko writes, Progress good on Sakisaka's chart for today. Before she can finish, Sakisaka is gone. It looks like someone sprayed the walls with pig guts from ceiling to floor. What color should the walls of a hospital be? White, of course. And to the creatures of rotten flesh sambling around me, I'm sure this hallway looks just as white as it should. I know, intellectually, that the walls are white. I know that the flesh beasts are really human. I'm the one with the problem, and it's because I've accepted this that I'm able to lead something approaching a normal life. Even if my university's medical department is nowhere near as good as T universities, I'm still a medical student specializing in neurology. I have a basic idea of what has happened to me, though it's hard to believe. This isn't a pathological condition. It's probably some form of agnosia... Agnosia? Agnosia? Unlike anything that's ever been studied before. The flesh beast called Tanbo Ryoko said that other patients had developed neurological disorders after receiving the same treatment I did. So I guess I'm just another failure. It makes me want to laugh in that know-it-all doctor's face. That said, I don't blame the doctors who operated on me. After all, I do owe them my life. I know as well as anyone how low a chance of success was, and that I had no other hope of survival. I was unlucky. That's all there is to it. The point is that my condition isn't treatable. Just like someone adapting to a hearing aid or wheelchair, I have no choice but to adapt to this nauseating scenery. Of course it's hard. It wasn't easy to resign myself to this fate. But now there's more than just despair. Even for me, there's a glimmer of hope. Keep my eyes on my feet so as to see as little of this horrifying world as possible, I hurry home. I live in a quiet suburban neighborhood, in a house that's much too big or large uh, for me alone. My parents, even unluckier than I was, died in the accident three months ago. I couldn't even go to the funeral for being in intensive care. I had to sell my father's business but at least that left me with the house and enough money to live on for a while. Of course I'm sad, but the accident 
took from me more than my parents. In fact, being on my own has probably saved me. If they were still alive, my parents would never have allowed me to live with some strange girl after all. As I open the door, a bright voice greets me from the kitchen. The voice is beautiful and clear as a bell. A human. Its sweet sound washes the day's cacophony from my memories. I'm home, Saya. Even the patter of feet climbing down the hallway is music to my ears. Nowhere else in the city can I hear such footsteps. Only in this house, with Saya, am I so privileged. Sorry. I had to stop at the hospital today. In her smile, in the inquisitive tilt of her head, is everything that I've lost. Since my accident, this girl is the only person I've met. Perhaps the only person in the entire world who does not trigger my cognitive disorder. True, her skin seems too white, and the color of her eyes and hair is probably different in reality. But even so, her form is undeniably human. And it's not just her appearance and her voice, but also her... As I bend down to take off my shoes, Saya wraps her arms around my neck and pulls me gently into her tiny bosom. Her skin feels truly human, not cold or slimy, and from her hair wafts the sweet fragments of a young girl. In all the world, only Saya is pleasing to my five senses. And what's more, she smiles at me, embraces me, she knows that she is my salvation, and for some reason, is happy that I need her. If I had not met Saya, if I had been all alone in this twisted, filth-ridden world, I would no doubt have succumbed to madness. It is no exaggeration to say that Saya alone is keeping me alive. What did you do today? もう半分ぐらい塗り終わったよ。で、今はね、海のりのパン I realized one day that if the natural colors of the world were sickening, all I had to do was paint over them with colors that seemed pleasant. I went to the hardware store and brought every color of paint I could find. Then, Sai and I tried different combinations until we found one that worked. After painting the bedroom from ceiling to floor, I was finally able to get my first good night's sleep since the accident. When we first started in the living room, Saya unsure of what to do with the curtains, just painted carefully around the windows. Without a moment's hesitation, I tore the curtains down and painted over the glass itself. No there would be anything out there that I'd want to see, and as long as we keep the storm shutters closed, the neighbors probably won't think anything of it. Can you bring it in here? As she enters the living room with a tray of food, Saya sniffs the air. Now that she mentions it, I suppose the smell of paint thinner must be building up in this closed room. It doesn't really bother me though. There are far worse smells outside. Does it bother you, Saya? Saya says the food on the table. Unfortunately, neither its color nor its smell is at all appetizing. Not that food anywhere else is any different. Thanks, Saya. As it has become routine, I steal myself and methodically transport the food into my mouth. 
the taste is as gut-wrenching as I expected. But it's not Saya's fault. I'm sure she made it exactly like the cooking show said. It's just that my taste buds can't accept it. She asks hesitantly. Well, no. Lying won't make Saya happy. She knows about my condition. Sorry. You always go through all the trouble of cooking, but I... In my current state, eating is nothing more than an unwelcome duty. As much as I hate it, I need food to survive. Or if I stay alive, then perhaps one day, as Saya says, I'll be able to taste something delicious again. I met Saya, didn't I? Aren't you going to eat? In all the time we've been together, Saya has never once eaten with me. I don't know why she refuses to do so. It makes me a little sad. Still, I'm not about to press the issue. Now she's putting up with all the problems that I have. And by the way, I asked about your father again. Papa no? Dr. Ogai Mashihiko, Saya's father, is her only relative. Saya has asked me to unveil the mystery of his disappearance. They still won't tell me anything. I get the feeling they're hiding something. So. I expected Sai to be a little more dejected. You haven't given up, have you? Sai so responds with an unreadable expression. She gives a little shake of her head and then smiles at me once again. It's nothing compared to what you've done for me. I thank her for the meal and set my chopsticks down next to the perfectly clean plate. As wretched as the taste was, thinking of the care that Saya put into it gave me the strength to finish every bite. Yeah, will you wash my back again? Ever since Saya moved in, it's been like having my own life. 